Let's look at the changes in these pressures that we just talked about during inspiration and expiration and relate them to how they really create inhalation and exhalation, allowing that to occur. So what are these pressures? There's intrapulmonary, there's intrapleural pressure, and this is pressure we're talking about. The difference between them two is going to be transpulmonary pressure, the different pressure difference across those two pressures. So I'm gonna add in a graph here and we're going to dissect it. Um, so this graph is showing up top the pressure relative to atmospheric pressure. Remember we said we talk about this relative to atmospheric. So zero is going to actually be equal to 760 millimeters of mercury which is the pressure of the atmosphere at um, sea level. <clears throat> so at rest, the intrapulmonary pressure, that's this pink line here, is zero. It's not different from atmospheric pressure. As we inspire, the thoracic muscles and the diaphragm are going to contract and um, decrease the pressure by increasing volume. Increased volume is gonna cause decreased pressure. That's shown as this line down here. That's what's going to allow air to flow into the lungs. This is volume of air entering and exiting the lung. So this is entering, volume inside the lung increases. That's what takes the pressure back to zero, equilibrates, equilibrates the pressure back to same as atmospheric levels. As we expire fully, those muscles relax, that decreases thoracic volume. That's going to cause pressure to rise inside the lungs, the thoracic cavity. And air is going to be forced out. So air is exiting. This is all occurring over about five seconds for a resting respiratory rate. So this would what the curve of <clears throat> intrapulmonary pressure would be decreasing during inspiration, increasing during expiration. Then we've got intrapleural volume of pressure is also what's shown here. Intrapleural, remember the one thing about it, it's always less than intrapulmonary. So negative four at rest, um, that negative value is keeping the lungs inflated. It's gonna drop down lower than that, why? Because it has to if we want the lungs to not collapse. It's gonna stay negative, always staying about two, um, about four, negative four compared to um, intrapulmonary pressure. So that's what's happening here, always negative. It's always negative compared to atmospheric pressure and intrapulmonary pressure. <clears throat> the volume of breath in, a, in, a, in one breath is about five, 0.5 liters or 500 milliliters. We'll see that again, that volume, which is called tidal volume. So first, um, I wanna look again at this negative pressure. And what happens if this negative pressure in the intrapleural space is disrupted? So again, We've got atmospheric pressure is 760. We're going to call that zero, right? At this is just a resting lung. We're going to have zero in here, minus four in here, and that's that's happy. So intrapleural pressure is four, zero. Um, Intra, I'm sorry, intrapulmonary pressure is zero, intrapleural pressure is four. When we have a 
Um, there can be various causes for collapsed lung. This could either be due to a knife wound like here, like, sorry, like here, or this could be due <clears throat> to air in the pleural cavity, which can cause um, damage. It could be various causes. A pneumothorax is when there's air, extra air in the pleural cavity. So damage to either side of this or just extra air in here is going to disrupt this, right? So this side, we're still good, zero and minus four. On this side, we still got zero, but this is going to be zero. When this intrapleural um, pressure becomes zero instead of negative four, this lung is going to collapse. So this emphasizes the importance of negative intrapleural pressure for maintaining lung inflation, which is important um, for lung function. The other thing that is important for lungs to stay inflated, one other thing is surfactant. So remember the surfactant that's produced by the type one alveolar, sorry, type two alveolar cells. Um, and this is related to surface tension. So I've got a picture showing this. I'm not gonna test you on this, but if you are a, a um, kind of chemistry person, this might be of interest. If you wanna understand how this works, I might not still do a complete justice. Surfactants are um, amphipathic. So they have a hydrophilic portion and a hydrophobic portion. That means they can interact with oil and um, decrease the surface tension of water. So they're going to disrupt how water interacts um, and make um, water have less surface tension. What this means to the lungs is that it actually um, is going to prevent collapsing and allow for the lungs to inflate with less work. So this example over here is without surfactant. Um, these two different alveoli have equal surface tension, but this one has higher pressure because the radius is smaller. Point is, it's more likely to collapse and it's harder to inflate. It takes more work to inflate. Kind of like when you're we're blowing up a balloon and when you first start blowing up the balloon, it's really tough, hard at first. It's a lot of work until it gets to be bigger. That decreased pressure um, as it gets bigger. Surfactant helps to get around this, to, to adjust for this. So this is the same two alveoli. And in this case, they um, one is going to have less surface tension because it has more surfactant. Right, so these smaller alveoli can have more surfactant and that can reduce surface tension to allow that pressure to equilibrate. So reducing surface tension reduces pressure and allows it to inflate faster and more easily and also then prevents collapsing as it goes back down again. So that's what the surfactant is, is doing in there. 